So I think uh, this week we're all, the whole nation is feeling what it's like when the professor gives back some of the grades, but not all of them yet. <laughs> I have graded none of them so far, none of your exams yet. So um, I will get working on that next week. I've got a few other things to take care of. Um, I don't know when exactly I'll have them back to you, but I will I will try to be at least as timely as the uh, vote counts, right? <laughs> which is not saying much, apparently. Um, okay, so we just had the exam. Um, we, I will kind of give you some feedback on that once I grade them uh, and have those for you. For now, we're going to go ahead and begin with wastewater treatment. So today I want to talk um, mostly about why we why we care about it, how we care about it in terms of how we regulate wastewater, um, and a little bit about how the regula regulations in the U.S. came about to help us understand essentially uh, what's our approach and what does it look like, what's driving the technologies that we're applying. So today we'll kind of cover the, the broad brush strokes of wastewater treatment have some case examples, and next time we'll begin uh, getting into the actual kind of mathematics and technological side of using essentially most, most of what wastewater does, in addition to the physical processes we've already learned about, like sedimentation, it also employs biological um, and biochemical. So the role of bacteria um, and other organisms, you can use algae um, to consume uh, stuff in the waste helps separate that stuff from um, from the waste stream before we discharge it is is really what a lot of wastewater treatment is going to be about. All right, so wanted to get going and kind of give us a reminder of this this page here, um, this uh, graphic. When we began chlorinating, uh, we saw a big decline in typhoid fever. So chlorination is obviously the, that last check before you consume water, uh, chlorination can help clean it. The other aspect of this is what we flush down the toilets because typhoid is one of these fecal oral route of transmission diseases. So in the States, you can see if we were going to use this as an indicator for that type of disease, back in 1900 all the way up to the 1940s, close to 1950, we had some level in, a, in terms of rates per 100,000 people, a significant number of people getting infected because contaminated waste streams were entering drinking or food supplies. So obviously that's a, that's a big issue. And what we're going to start talking about now is on the, you know, not the chlorination, but on the wastewater treatment side, because because if we treat our wastewater well enough, then any disease that is um, human specific, not animal specific, uh, we can take care of. And typhoid is a good example of that. Okay, so a few, a few notes here. These are pictures I took from Nicaragua some years back. Um, I wanted to show a, a glimpse of these and I, I searched every, every year, every semester, I search for my high definition picture of this and I just can't find it. So this is kind of a grainy picture. Um, but what we see here in the, the bottom, it's most startling, is this green water flowing through a landfill, essentially. And people are actually using this as a, a way to recycle or find recyclables and separate recyclables from this landfill. It's really an, just a horrendous environment, um, very unsafe, very um, kind of the antithetical to hygienic, right? The, the, um, the opposite. So that's obviously a, a, a depiction of what we don't want. Um, another thing that I came across in Nicaragua was this gold mining operation. So this little hut thing has a, a uh, an engine that is taking these large stones and dragging them around in circles in this um, mercury water slurry to amalgamate gold, so this is a gold mining operation in rural Nicaragua, and their wastewater treatment. Once they're, you know, once they're done with this, they're basically allowing allowing the stuff to flow th around in circles and through this. Essentially, you can see here, it's going through this little channel, 
and into this little sedimentation pond thing, which is probably somewhat helpful, but ultimately that's all the treatment they've got. And they were working with this relatively unpro unprotected. So you can imagine the, uh, the hazard of mercury escape here from this tiny little industry may be contaminating a lot of, um, you know, whoever is using the local aquifers as a drinking water source or and the animals and things, they're going to have some pretty serious mercury contamination. So just a couple of food for thought in terms of the worst case scenarios, uh, looking at our municipal or industrial type of things, if there's no real infrastructure developed in place, um, this is, you know, some depictions of what that might end up looking like. Now, this green, um, you know, the stuff that looks really, really toxic, just if you were to identify green as toxic, it's actually probably lots of algae that was from a wastewater stabilization pond, and the landfill itself is probably adding a lot of toxins to it. I'm not saying that it was treated very well, it probably wasn't, but it has had at least a little bit of treatment before discharging into that area. All right, so in terms of what we want to do, we've seen this picture a few times now, with regards to a fully developed system, what we want to do is contain any industrial pollutants and all of our municipal uh, discharges from homes, things like that, and collect all of this into our wastewater treatment plant before those streams get to the, to the lakes, rivers, or groundwater, wherever we're discharging it. So that's going to be kind of the focus here. A lot of our discussions will also be relevant to industries that have to pre-treat their water. So sometimes an industry might be, um, maybe they have a waste stream that has a bunch of toxic metals and our typical municipal treatment plant can't handle, can't remove effectively toxic chemicals. And so according, you know, by the EPA regulations, if there was a bunch of toxic metals discharged from this wastewater treatment plant, they'd get in trouble. So in order to avoid that problem, what they, they do is when an industry wants to dump into the sewer, they say, no, 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 you have to have, you have to ask us and pay us a certain amount first. And because we can't deal with these types of pollutants, you have to do pretreatment. Otherwise we can't accept your waste. So in terms of wastewater discharge, if an industry does want to discharge to a wastewater plant so that the wastewater treatment plant who has all this infrastructure can do most of the treatment, then there, there may be some caveats there. If the industry was producing lots of uh, chemicals that was toxic to bacteria, that could also be a problem because the, maybe it's very acidic or very basic or something. That could be a problem because then the wastewater treatment plants, the bacteria that are happily growing might all die and then the treatment itself is stops and that causes a massive problem. So there's several reasons why industries um, if they're discharging to a municipal um, treatment plant, they may have to do pretreatment. Not always. Um, something like a car wash might be okay um, to, to just send it down to the sewer line if it's just detergents and some uh, dirt and stuff. But certainly there are some industries that require pretreatment. And there's also some industries that will elect to do their own wastewater treatment and discharge to a to groundwater or a river or whatever um, and they'll be regulated just like the wastewater treatment plant would be so there's an option there as well um, and that that type of treatment then would be more specific to that that given industry or operation uh, it might have some similar components to our municipal wastewater treatment but it, they can they are allowed to do that but again they need a permit um, so we'll be talking mostly about what happens in the kind of municipal sewer system type of wastewater treatment that we normally think about. Um, but again, a lot of these will be relevant. Sometimes industries will just have to account for things a little bit different because they're, the waste that they're treating is a little bit different. All right, so to zoom in a little closer, what does a typical wastewater treatment plant look like? Here's a schematic from our book. We've got 
some things that are should already be familiar, right? We've got these sedimentation basins, we've got primary sedimentation, and we see we have a secondary sedimentation. So kind of the same concept as we see in our typical drinking water plant that's you know taking from uh, surface water. In, in addition to that, we have the this grit chamber and a screen, screen and bar rack. That's going to be a little bit more important with wastewater because there's just more junk in our wastewater. But again, essentially the same thing. We have some mechanical, physical screening, remove stuff that's going to harm or clog the, the plumbing in the treatment process. And then we settle whatever we can with our primary sedimentation. By this time, um, the sewage has been, uh, has traveled through at least a, several pumps, which are generally pretty good at grinding up whatever's in there, um, especially after the screen and bar rack, they'll, they'll be having pumps that are pumping this stuff, and those pumps themselves help to homogenize, to break up all any uh, loose particles or whatever, um, chunks of stuff, toilet paper, whatever. Um, so typically, by the time it's making it through in here, you've got a relatively homogeneous uh, slurry that's got some particles in it and um, not a lot of large particles that you can just screen out with a mesh. Okay, so you do that. You sediment whatever you know dense particles you're able to, then send it into a bioreactor. So this bioreactor will spend a fair amount of time talking about the simple case is to have a bioreactor where you are bubbling air or oxygen through, promoting bacteria to grow, and letting those bacteria eat whatever is in, in the water. So maybe there's a bunch of sugar and fats and grease stuff in, in the water. Well, those microbes then were intentionally growing them, letting them consume that, and converting dissolved stuff. So we have got dissolved organic matter into or converting that into cells which can then be separated physically. So if we if we're growing bacteria cells, not only are we converting to something dissolved that's hard to remove to something that's solid that we can actually capture with a sedimentation or a membrane or something, it's also converting some of the chemistry. So instead of um, all sorts of chemicals, large, small, big mixture, the bacteria can also transform a lot of those chemicals into um, simpler, simpler chemicals. And ultimately, one thing that's happening is we're providing a lot of oxygen. And that's key because if we just discharge the waste into a river, the big obvious problem that happens when we do that is the river goes anoxic because bacteria in the river have all this food and they consume all this food doing their respiration and pull the oxygen out of the water. So if nothing else, adding the oxygen is letting that happen in a controlled environment where we don't want, we don't care if there are fish growing here, obviously there's not going to be, um, instead of happening out in the, the rivers, streams, whatever, um, receiving water that we're gonna discharge us to um, and causing problems for the wildlife there. Okay, so that's a, a big component, and we'll talk a little more about the different types of contaminants and the different uh, priorities they have. From there, we do a secondary sedimentation. This is going to capture a lot of these bacterial cells, and for the purpose of our class, we're actually going to assume that it does a very good job at that, pretty much perfect. So as water is going through, we end up with a sludge. There's still some chemicals in here, typically, um, but a lot of them have been converted and exchanged, you know, bacteria like us, they'll be doing respiration, we breathe in oxygen, use energy, make new cells, all this, and exhale CO2. So some of that's going to be bacteria inhaling oxygen, exhaling CO2. Some of it's going to be making new cells, and those cells we capture. And the net result is we have a transport of the dissolved organics and stuff, dissolved stuff, from that dissolved state into a solid, you know, physical form that we can then compress, squeeze the water out of, and send to a landfill. 
um, or potentially to incinerate or something. Uh, sometimes we would take it and create what, what's called biosolids, something that we can actually um, apply to, uh, to land as a fertilizer. So there's, there's some added complexity we can do in terms of recycling. What do we do with the sludge? Almost always we send some of the bacteria back in so that we have a continuous amount of bacteria in the system happily growing. So some of the equations we'll end up dealing with will be dealing specifically with keeping those bacteria happy in that system. There's some other processes that we could do in terms of allowing a different set of bacteria to grow in anaerobic conditions. You get different biochemistry. So you'll be able to remove a fair amount of stuff with the oxygen rich environment, but if you change it and do an oxygen depleted environment, you get a different type of bacteria. They use different chemical processes, essentially doing the same thing just in a different format. So some systems will actually alternate from a aerated to an anaerobic um, reactors. And there's a lot of research and um, kind of technology and information there. After this secondary treatment, so this bioreactor and the sedimentation and disinfection are altogether kind of considered our secondary treatment. Um, after that, we typically disinfect and then discharge. Sometimes we'll add tertiary treatment and in that case, we'd probably put the disinfection last um, after the tertiary. But the tertiary that we do sometimes would really be targeting specific removal of nutrients. Um, or maybe there's some other contaminant that we just really have a lot of and it's a very specific things so we have to treat with some specific technology to polish the water, make sure that it's a really going to be protecting the receiving water, that would fall into a tertiary category. Um, we'll say that's targeted. Typically we're thinking of nutrients in terms of phosphorus, um, nitrogen, Whereas this bioreactor itself, carbon is a, obviously the kind of the biggest nutrient, um, followed by nitrogen and then by phosphorus. And carbon is a lot of what we're remo removing here when we're talking about letting those organics, um, dissolved organics be digested. Okay. I have a question about the yeah. bioreactor. You said we want oxygen in the bioreactor? Yeah, so we, we typically want as much oxygen as we can in the bioreactor, unless we're doing an anaerobic process. Typically, we're dealing with aerobic um, or aerated systems. And a lot of times, we'll, we'll talk about this as waste activated sludge. And that activated means we're activating it with, with oxygen or air. So you'll see um, as, we, as we go on, this bioreactor will often be referred to as um, waste activated sludge or WAS. There are cases where we decide to do it anaerobic, but pretty much in every case we will have an aerobic, an aerated one somewhere in the treatment train. Okay, so for water quality standards, essentially our regulations are designed to protect the receiving water. I've mentioned this a couple times now. What I mean by receiving water is whatever lake or stream, river, whatever that this water that we're discharging is going to enter. We want to protect that body of water for any intended use. So if we if we decide that we want to be able to fish in our waters and be able to eat the fish, we need to protect that ability. And in fact, we have decided as a country that every receiving water, um, with a few very minor exceptions, there's some controversy with 
runoff from farms where you've got irrigation ditches that are mostly transporting water to irrigate and they have very poor water quality because you're dumping a bunch of fertilizers in there and we're not actually expecting uh, to be growing you know to for that to be a habitat um, things like that get exceptions if we're making a wastewater stabilization pond it's a very kind of rudimentary but for small systems it can be quite effective we make a pond and send water to that pond we don't expect to be having a habitat there unless we're you know maybe we're planting some some plants to do some phytoremediation but ultimately that's designated as an engineered water body that is for wastewater treatment so we exempt that type of a, a system but aside from that pretty much all bodies of water including marshes and wetlands are going to be regulated uh, such that we're protecting intended use. Uh, we'll talk a little more about that when we look at this NPDES um, permitting system. Typically, the EPA is going to delegate this regulatory authority. So it's, there are federal guidelines, but they typically get delegated to the states or um, also could be uh, uh, Native American tribes. Um, tribal authorities can also take that authority. I don't think any have, um, so the EPA would be regulating them if not. And essentially, this system was designed to, initially, we wanted to eliminate all pollution discharges. That was kind of the ultimate goal at first. Um, it quickly became to reduce um, pollutant discharges. It's not actually practical to eliminate all pollutant discharges. It's going to cost a lot more then it's worth to eliminate a little bit extra of dissolved organics we call we would call BOD biological oxygen demand if we had just a little bit and we're adding it to a river that already has some we're not actually making much of an impact if at all so we we can do some calculations some biological surveys of the receiving water and find that okay we're really not going to impact this river if we discharge x amount of stuff you know a one milligram per liter of salt added it to a river or stream is very likely not going to harm anything even if you raised the whole streams um, salt concentration by that that's that might have absolutely no observable effect so that would be an example of pollution that's we're able to discharge um, and it would be cost prohibitive to to just say okay no you can't do anything you must uh, just charge only pure ultra pure water that's that's not very realistic okay so that intended use is what's really important the other thing that the regulations allow for is actually protection of industries so you know there, it's pretty common to to see the debates about uh, regulations oh they're so bad for industries oh they're so important for the environment well one thing that I think a lot of people miss is the fact that regulations actually help many industries in that they protect them from lawsuits. So in terms of, at least in terms of wastewater treatment, if the government, if the EPA says, all right, you are allowed to discharge this amount, we give you a permit, it's like a driver's license. It can be revoked, but um, industries, companies will pay a certain amount, acquire this permit, they're given these regulations, if they follow those regulations, they have been legally permitted to discharge XYZ pollutants. And they are no longer um, liable for any damages that those pollutants are discharging because they have, they were permitted to do so by the government. So in that way, it saves the industry from having to do all of the studies themselves to say, okay, well, is this gonna harm anybody to prove that they didn't harm anybody and to prove that no, this is not carcinogenic. So if they didn't have a regulatory agency giving them these permits and making these decisions for them, every individual company would have some liability to prove that for themselves, that no, my, my chemical discharge was actually low enough where there's no observable, observable effects. It did not contaminate your fish and give you cancer. You know, this, all of that type of thing, um, it actually ends up uh, protective when when done right 
obviously there's room for error. Uh, we've talked a lot about <laughs> errors in the Flint water crisis. So it's not, I'm not expecting it to be perfect and I'm not expecting it to, in all cases, be an obvious benefit to the industries, but that's a, an important consideration there. And I remember um, I was, so I was briefly a, a permit writer for this NPDES system. I remember having a conversation with somebody um, from a nuclear power plant or listening in on a conversation, I think. And they were basically saying, we love regulations because that allows us to do what we, we need to do and helps us understand what we need to do in order to do everything safely. Like that, that is, they, they view the regulations as imperative that or that company does. Okay, so what types of pollutants are we interested in? Um, so there's a few that we categorize as conventional pollutants. These ones are maybe the, the first ones that we identified back in the day when we were discharging wastewater and we realized, well, there's some harmful effects to the water that we're discharging all this waste to. So the first one is biological oxygen demand. I mentioned this. This is this term, BOD, it's a measurement of the amount of oxygen in milligrams per liter, so the amount of stuff we breathe, that is demanded by organisms as they consume organic matter. So if we dump a bunch of sugar into a lake, there's going to be bacteria that are demanding oxygen because they're eating that sugar. Just like we have to breathe if we eat sugar or anything, um, that respiration process um, can show us that there's some waste in the water. And really, it's equivalent to the amount of food for the bacteria in the water. So what I'm going to say is this is essentially the food. Uh, so we'll say bacterial food. We will also call this pretty often substrate. So substrate meaning the stuff you use to build or grow on. So the bacteria are using some chemicals, some dissolved organics as a substrate to grow and replicate and as an energy source. And what we do because waste, all these waste compounds are so complex, you can imagine what you're flushing down the toilets and the um, down your drains. You're going to have some laundry detergent. You're going to have some dirt and grease from your laundry that you washed. You're going to have probably some egg yolk that spilled down the sink when you're washing out your bowl when you made scrambled eggs. You're going to have uh, urea and all sorts of stuff from your um, your toilet flushes. There's going to be lots of stuff in there, right? It's a complex mixture. So BOD gives us a very simplified way to identify how much food is there for the bacteria that are going to allow them to demand oxygen. So this is a, a big simplification that we can use. And so the way we define it is that amount of oxygen taken or demanded by microbes over a given time through respiration as they're eating this stuff. Okay, so I, already, I wrote it twice. Essentially what's happening is we have oxygen plus this food and we're making, um, we're making CO2 and extra cells. And this is, so this is them using it for energy and growth. And this is again, very simplified version here. Okay, so that's conventional contaminant number one. So, and again, it, this, if you have lots of oxygen demanding substances in your water, you discharge that into a lake, it's going to go anoxic, that's going to be a problem. The next would be total suspended solids. We've mentioned this before. This is essentially particles, um, solids that are suspended in the water. Um, we typically measure this by running water through a filter and drawing that filter, weighing it before and after we've done the filtration. And so we measure the weight in milligrams, typically, of particles in a liter of water, for example. 
So pH would be the next one. That's fairly obvious. Uh, wastewater treatment does um, some steps, depending on what we're doing, might have the pH adjusted or um, higher or lower. So we have to be careful about that. Fecal coliforms, talked a lot about that already. We want to make sure we're not adding a huge amount of bacteria to um, rivers and streams. For protecting recreation, even though there are naturally occurring coliforms, bacteria of all sorts in water, we don't want to be overloading them to an unsafe degree so that if you go swimming, you're guaranteed to get pink eye in both eyes and blah, 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 get sick. Pink eye, by the way, is essentially a bacterial infection that is typically fecal to eye um, in some way or another. Now, it might not, might not always be that direct. Um, so you could have gotten it from swimming or something and bacteria, um, you opened your eyes or uh, scrubbed your eyes afterwards and you get bacteria in there. But typically that's gonna be some sort of bacteria that thrives in warm um, gut type of conditions. So, um, you know, in terms of protecting our recreational uh, uses of waters, that, you know, it has some obvious import importance there. Another one would be oil and grease. And we'll see a couple examples of why in particular this is so important and why we identified this. Uh, but essentially, if you are discharging, um, you know, like a, a restaurant is flushing lots of oil and grease down into the sewers, we don't want that accumulating um, out in our rivers and other bodies of waters. Okay, so speaking of oil and grease, this is a picture of a river fire. Yes, a river on fire uh, from, I think this is the Cuyahoga River. I think it was 1954. Um, I do have an article. I will post this to Moodle for your interest. So let me, uh, Make this a little bigger. So this has got some pictures from kind of before and after. Um, you can see in this picture here that he's put a uh, gloved hand in the water. Actually, I don't even know if he has a glove, but it looks like he's got a glove because of all the, the oil and grease that has now collected on his hand. Um, and again, that picture of this fire, 1952. Okay, so then there's this, I have, a, I think, a couple quotes from this um, in our lecture today. So I will post this. I think I already have a link in the, um, in the PowerPoint itself. So obviously, we don't want our rivers catching on fire. That's a, a big no-no. Um, that kind of helped. Several fires like this helped spur uh, public interest in protecting our lakes and rivers because it's just you know you see that boats on fire and what are you going to do you know you've got water everywhere to pour on it but how are you going to how are you going to make sure that you're not pulling more grease to throw onto the grease fire and are you supposed to throw grease on a, a water on a grease fire i don't think so you know this is this is just bad news overall so um that that's just kind of a nightmare scenario um and i I would feel sorry for any firefighter that would have to deal with that. A more modern example was a, uh, an oil spill, a pipe broke. Um, this is in, in or near Moscow. Let me pull that one up for you. And I'm gonna see, see if I can adjust the sound settings for you online. Just give me one moment. I'm, need to do something on the back end to allow myself to uh, to do this. Oh, sorry. That's not what I wanted to do. Okay. Still not what I want to do. All right, we're just going to do it. All right, so there's a little video here. Um, see if I 
could play it and enlarge it. going to try to play it through the uh, speakers in the classroom so you can hear the fire because it's pretty pretty impressive. I think I just fixed the settings. We'll see. There you go. So just listening to that, uh, <laughs> the burning happening there is just really kind of crazy. Yes. Yeah, so this was a, a pipe that was going underneath that river. I, I think it was just going across there and it, it burst or ruptured and was spilling and then it caught fire. And so how to deal with oil spills, I don't think this is the right way to deal with oil spills, you know. I, I think that that was a, a pretty big disaster there. <laughs> um, so it, it kind of crazy to see a modern example. Fortunately, even in Moscow, that's not a, such a typical uh, occurrence, I don't think. Um, yeah, you can see that it's just a massive, massive issue there. The question was, did I do much with the BP oil spill? I did not directly. I was in graduate school when it happened, and as a PhD student, I had my qualifying exams. So the BP oil spill happened like April 14th or 10th or something. I think it was 10th, um, 2010. Um, and in August, I had a, my big uh, qualifying exam thing, and several of my questions were on it. So I, I'd been paying attention to it um, over that summer, just as kind of like, wow, big news kind of a thing. So I, I can tell you a little bit about it from what I know. Um, and in fact, it's very interesting, and it relates directly to um, wastewater here. So Essentially what's happening in this picture with the, the burning river is we're oxidizing all this all these chemicals. Now this is a chemical oxidation reaction. The bacteria are doing biochemical oxidation. Let me mute this for you. I hear this just a sec, I hear the speakers and I don't I don't ever like to uh you just mute them. Um Okay, so there's a difference between the, the chemical oxidation, and we actually will talk about this a little bit later. Um, chemical oxidation and bio, biochemical oxidation. The chemical, if you get it hot enough, you're just gonna oxidize everything. You've got oxygen present or ozone or something, an oxidant. Um, so in terms of an oil spill, a lot of people probably have heard of the Exxon Valdez. It was a massive oil spill in Alaska back in the 90s and then we had this massive one Deepwater Horizon 2010. Now a lot of people that knew about the Exxon Valdez and had experienced that were really worried because this BP oil spill was even larger. Uh, but if you were to compare the two there's a couple of really important differences. Um, well first of all if you're just looking at volume yeah the BP oil spill dwarfed the Exxon Valdez and was a much, much bigger impact. In terms of the relevant chemistry going on and biochemistry, if you think about Alaska, it's essentially a refrigerator most of the year. And if you think about how to allow bacteria to eat stuff, well, you, when you don't want that to happen, you don't want bacteria growing, you put it in a refrigerator. So that's the first thing is Alaska is very cold most of the year, refrigerator if not freezer, and so any bacterial activity, which is kind of the default cleanup process for, for the environment, unless it's too toxic for the bacteria to grow on, which eventually, usually bacteria will find a way as long as it's dilute enough or something. So usually we default to enhancing bacteria and their ability to degrade stuff. That's almost always what we try to do 
if there's a, some sort of chemical spill, um, especially widespread in the environment. So usually what we're doing in the soil is stimulating it, providing it the right nutrients so that bacteria will do that work for us so we don't have to scoop it all up, run water through it all, and clean it you know, manually that way. So that gets really expensive. Now, the, so there's one difference, right? We've got the uh, incubator oven of the Gulf, which is often very warm, and that was happening over the spring and summer. And so that was a warm environment, um, more ideal for bacterial growth to degrade this stuff. Compare that to the kind of refrigerator scenario in the Alaska. The other thing that was true was the Exxon Valdez was a much, um, the crude was a, uh, I want to say denser and had was kind of a thicker um, longer chain uh, molecules on average whereas the the deep water horizon that well was providing us a lighter crude that had smaller um, smaller chain um, molecules and essentially that also made it easier to biodegrade now still there's obviously lots of issues lots of fallout, lots of important work to understand what all was impacted, but the good news was that it was much more likely to degrade quicker and more fully given that it was, you know, given the conditions for the Deepwater Horizon compared to the Exxon Valdez. There was a lot more of the between the Exxon Valdez. Yeah, so the, the Exxon Valdez, um, as I understand it, was a lot more difficult to deal with. It's a lot more kind of on the grounds operations, the cleanup crews. Right, so the bacteria really, it's multiplying and just simply growing and consuming stuff. That and the, um, the physical dispersion, um, it washed up on a bunch of shores. And I don't, I don't remember um, whether or not those shores were getting lots of wave action, but that's just a very different condition and environment than happening out in the open ocean and then having all the wave action miles out at sea before getting to a shoreline. I think the Exxon Valdez oiled a bunch of shores, a bunch of habitat early on before, before that. I, I mean, quicker than it did with our, um, the Deepwater Horizon. So there's, there's a lot of factors involved there. Certainly, um, it's a good thing neither caught on fire because that probably is not uh, the right cleanup solution. <laughs> okay. So fire with a deep water, yeah, they might have. Um, oh wow. Um, so we've got somebody saying that they were seeing seeing fire burn, burning on the Gulf from uh, Florida shores at the time. I didn't remember seeing that, but it's entirely possible. Um, there's a chance maybe somebody did try that as a uh, kind of a contaminant uh, <laughs> stop, last resort sort of thing, but I don't know that that was, yeah, I, I can't quite remember. Um, it's, well, it's, I remember the smoke, like they had smoke and stuff for a while that you could see from Okay. That was the oil rig, like I I do oil rig or I remember the oil rig itself. I believe did have a, a fire, um, and had didn't the rig itself kind of explode or have a very large uh, large fire? So yeah, I think there was certainly the rig did did have a fire issue, but I don't I don't think the slick itself was all on fire like you see in like this. I mean, and it wouldn't be really possible for it to sustain a fire for too long with just all the wave action and everything, I, I would think. But. Yeah, not, not a good thing, not a good situation there. So in terms of domestically, um, you know, the, the striking thing is we're talking about these oil spills and the, uh, this pipeline burst, but this one here back in the 1950s, that was just because people were dumping their, their grease and oil um, from their, you know, automotive repair shops or whatever, uh, restaurants, all that grease was ending up in the rivers and that caught on fire. So that's, that's pretty nasty. I, I've heard that, um, you know, the, uh, the other way regulations can kind of 
help industry sometimes was a lot of these industries when they were starting to be required to uh, catch a lot of their grease they realized oh we can actually just process this a little bit and then we can recycle it and uh, have a lot less of our product our um, stuff wasted and so some improvements in efficiency there <clears throat> okay so outside of these conventional ones that become very apparent when your pH drops and kills all the fish or the oxygen depletes and kills all your fish or your river catches on fire so the other pollutants um, we categorize as toxics or non-conventional um, so toxics would include rather obviously heavy metals and organic compounds, so at least a specific list of them. So something like toluene or benzene, things that we know are carcinogenic or otherwise hazardous, toxic, um, you'll find those in, in our list of um, toxic pollutants. Then there's everything else, which we just lump in as non-conventional. This would include things like chlorine, Technically, it's toxic, but we also drink chlorinated water, so it's not, you know, toxic is, toxin is, you know, maybe the not, not the right classification, and we use it to disinfect, so the point here is that we can discharge some, but we should not be discharging a lot. Um, ammonia, it's a nutrient, nitrite, um, and nitrate, and phosphorus, so these nutrients. Um, there's all sorts of other things if you were to be discharging, for example, um, surfactants, soaps, detergents, um, those would probably fall in this non-conventional. They might not be hazardous, but if you're causing lots of bubbles in the stream, that just doesn't seem quite right and might in, you know, impact the wildlife, impair your intended use. Um, so there's, there's all sorts of things that we can consider, uh, but these are... Uh, those are the three categories, the conventional, the toxics, and then the non-conventional. So, um, to, oh yeah, I, I want to show you this too. Um, in terms of our treatment then, so we've got those pollutants, we talked about kind of what a typical treatment system looks like, then we get to what we call primary treatment. And so I want to start talking about primary treatment, and the first, um, first step of that would be kind of the bar and screen racks as you send stuff down through the sewer and then you you're entering the entering the treatment plant you want a nice bar rack a grit chamber something to protect all of your plumbing and mechanics inside your treatment plant so primary treatment is just that um, I want to talk about this briefly and then we'll move on um, because this is kind of the funny part. Um, then we'll talk about the uh, NPDES permit writer's manual that I've got for you uh, posted. So, um, kind of a uh, another visual here for you, and I do need the sound. Um, for those of you online, are, were you able, did the sound work okay? Was it coming through? Or were you just hearing it through the um, the room speakers. If you could answer that, that would be good. Because I can try to adjust for you. All right. So this is the little video. When I was first lecturing on this, it was it just appeared on my feed, and I've used it every time since because this is an important message about um, okay, awesome about flushable wipes. Um, sorry, one second going only through my uh, laptop again because I changed it. All right. Give me just a moment. The uh, sound system's always a little bit finicky here. Well, 
Well, it would help if I didn't mute it. That, that would be good. All right. Still no. OK. One sec. There we go. Not that you really need it. So always amusing. Um, in fact, okay, I don't know what to play next. Um, perhaps the most amusing part is that guy saying, I've never seen one dissolved. Because would you see something that is dissolved? Is that something that we can visually see, especially in the context of a wastewater treatment plant? No. Um, the point, though, is that they do not dissolve. And you do have toured treatment plants enough to see, quote, flushable wipes. Yes, they f have flushed down the toilet. That is true. What happened after that? Well, that's another question. Um, so don't flush flushable wipes. That's the moral of the story. Um, and that also kind of shows the importance of the mechanical screening. That was That's this next little video. Um, I think this is probably just some sort of advertisement for a company who makes these little screen racks. But it's a good visual for in terms of kind of what it looks like. Um, and what it does. So, uh, no, they do not sponsor me. I just felt like their little info ad was useful. And it looks like that one doesn't have sound, so we'll just watch. Okay, so in this case, we have um, water coming through and filled with all these particles. And it's just showing they're collecting on this, this bar screen. And every so often, it's going to scrape up and pull up all of these particles and just have this automated system where um, as water's pass passing through, it's just taking baskets, essentially, of, of all this junk and on a kind of a continuous basis, sending that to a landfill. Um, I've seen several different setups like this. Uh, this one's a pretty common one to my knowledge. Um, and it's just basically going to take that little tray of junk and deposit it in in a um, container there, which will then take it to a um, uh, basically a, a waste bin for, for landfilling. Um, so the Detroit wastewater treatment plant, one of the largest in the country, uh, in terms of how much volume they treat, they they have a room full of these and they're operating in nasty 24/7. Um, so this this is quite common. Um, this is the first place you'd find your flushable wipes. Quote um, if they didn't get clogged up in your uh, sewer collection system itself, and hopefully they don't make it too far past this. But you will see uh, invariable um, things like this do can and do get through um, but you see this this will just continue uh, for some time and bring it up into that dumpster uh, bin <clears throat> and I could have just played this on a faster speed all right so you get the picture it's kind of cool completely automated um, gives a nice amount of control there. So that would be kind of the basics of a screen or bar rack. Maybe you have something a little different. A lot of times you'll have a grit chamber. A uh, grit chamber would be 
um, perhaps in addition to the, the bar rack. Um, and this would often be something like um, maybe a barrel that water comes in and it's, say it's kind of a cylinder. I've seen one that's like this, it's got a lot of holes, you know, kind of a mesh in it. Water's coming through and it's uh, kind of circulating and collecting whatever grit, small, fine particles are collecting in it and um, retaining those and letting those um, be collected for disposal. And this would be kind of a way to do a, a finer mesh, fil not, not filtration, but a sort of like a screen. Um, there's all sorts of configurations you can do, but um, water would be coming in and then pouring through the holes and you're just basically collecting all the grit um, that you can. Again, looking for uh, any little pebbles or something that got kicked into the stream or um, you know, popcorn kernels that made, it, made their way down the, uh, the drain and might break or otherwise damage your plumbing in the wastewater treatment system. Yeah, so that's a, a great question about, you know, is it better to throw away food or put it down the disposal? Um, in general, if you're, if you're sending food waste down the drain, if you have a garbage disposal and you use it, then presumably it's not going to mechanically harm anything. But that food will, we're spending energy to recover it from the waste, from the water, right? So in some sense, in terms of an energy efficiency, like maximizing the amount of money you spent versus um, saved, putting it in the garbage bin and sending it to the landfill up front will save it from going into the water, being separated out into a million pieces, and then putting all that energy to collecting it back into something and extracting it back out. Um, so you, you are saving, in, in a sense, by not doing that. It's also potentially saving the plumbing and stuff especially if you're, if you're separating grease. Um, if grease is clogging up your pipes, that's you know, a, an infrastructure problem in the making, um, which would be costly either to you or to whatever, um, uh, to the, whoever's managing the sewer collection system. So depending on what it is, you, know, you don't wanna be pouring popcorn kernels down there because like you've seen, it could become one of these fat bergs or could damage the, the stuff in there. Obviously, if one goes down, your system doesn't break down that day and you have problems. It's just, it's not something you, you know, it's something that you ought to avoid, right? Um, it's an interesting thing to think about because normally we don't think about what we're flushing down the, the waste stream. But essentially, we spend a lot of money and effort to remove it. So if you can do that on the front end, that's, that's better. Um, there's actually a lot of uh, research and work uh, considering separating urine from the, the waste stream as well because it's if you just have urine as a waste stream itself separated from other um, other types of waste you can do specific treatments and extract lots of usable nutrients for fertilizers that way um, whereas when it's all mixed together with other stuff it's it's more difficult so you'll see that in some some locations that are really exploring green technologies So the question is that why some toilets have like the smaller button and the larger button? Um, yes and no. So the, if it's just the, the, the toilet tank has those two different buttons, that's just telling the toilet, okay, we only need a little bit of water to flush this down, not a, a full flush. But in some systems, um, some toilets may be designed so that there's a compartment that you urinate in, and that would be most likely collecting separate uh, separate things. I haven't seen those, I don't think, in the States and in, in public spaces. I, I might have seen some when I traveled. Um, I've traveled other places before, but yeah, that's, it's kind of along the same lines. If you are able to separate it and it's convenient that way, then you can kind of make, make use of more resources. But then again, you know, unless you're that specific facility, that building is making, is doing that, then we're not going to install a completely separate sewer line for just urine and, and do all that. That would be way too expensive, right? So there's, there's some uh, reasons why we don't do it um, logistically, 
Uh, but there's some potential for, I guess, uh, niche cases that, that can, can make use of that. All right, so last thing I want to introduce to you is this uh, Permit Writer's Handbook. Um, well, actually, yeah, we'll, we'll come back to this part. So jokingly, I will say this is the most exciting part. Um, uh, the reason I'm joking about that is because I, uh, in 2015, so this was as of 2015 here, um, I went to a week-long training in Chicago, actually. I was working in Michigan, so we traveled down to Chicago for this permit writer's uh, course. And I was already sort of feeling a little bit bored at my job. It was it really was an entry level position and I, I wasn't making use of any of the graduate work I had done. Um, so I was already kind of thinking about maybe trying to go back to academia. And th this permit writers course kind of sealed the deal because if you can imagine um, uh, eight hours a day for four and a half days um, of talking about regulations, but it wasn't just talking about regulations, it was talking about regulations in a monotone voice just about like this and there was really the most excitement was about like this <laughs> there were a few uh, different speakers but that that's kind of how it felt um, so there was good information and this this permit writers workbook has good information there are interesting things within this but it just it, it didn't um, wasn't quite selling it for me and I uh, I kind of laugh about it every time. So what I'm going to do is kind of walk you through just real quickly this first and second module about kind of the the scope. What is the water, the Clean Water Act, and what is the scope of this? I've posted this to Moodle for you um, in case you're interested. So we'll just go through a little bit of it. Um, so early on, the really our wastewater management and regulations were, were sort of first associated with keeping rivers navigable. So you imagine our, um, the Mississippi River, obviously anything that's, um, anything that's impairing the navigation for ships was a, was a big issue. Now that's not like wastewater discharge, but that's managing the, the what would eventually be our receiving waters. Later, that became, so in 1899, we had the Rivers and Harbors, Harbors Act. Later, we had a Federal Water Pollution Control Act, so 1948. That's when we really became to, we began to formalize our human health concerns. Um, if you remember back at that chart, that was also about the time where we pretty much had uh, next to no typhoid um, cases uh, per, per 100,000 in the state. So that was, you know, we're starting to officially, you know, officiate this around the time where we've got some control already in place. Then we've got 1965, the Water Quality Act um, that required standards for interstate water. So uh, waters like the Mississippi. Um, here's this Cuyahoga River example. Um, there was an article in Time magazine um, in 1969. So uh, later, after lots of regulations, we see kind of a success story. We'll find a quote in here from uh, one of these articles in a minute. So the EPA was established, and the uh, essentially the RAPP was an executive order that sort of tried to establish something like the uh, this pollutant discharge elimination thing. That got struck down, but it, it made progress in the right direction. And maybe for some some uh, optimistic look at all things political lately, I think sometimes the way stuff works is even if the, the even if some movement or uh, action, maybe you don't feel like that's the right action, if it was in a good direction, maybe that's what's important because once things settle, you know, this is 50 years later, we have the EPA, it's doing some good stuff. Um, and it's, we have much cleaner water. So even if, for example, this RAPP was struck down, wasn't constitutional or something, um, something Congress at that point began to fashion a program uh, in its own legislation. 
Okay, so from 1972 to present, we've had the Federal Water Pollution Control Act um, amendments there. So we have the Clean Water Act 1977 that followed. That really was um, prioritizing pollutants, effluent guidelines. Um, the Water Quality Act in 1987 uh, further focused on uh, these water quality based effluent limits. So in terms of the receiving water to make sure it had a good enough water quality to, to be happy, um, we're making some effluent limits based on that and we're also adding stormwater control at this point. Okay, so then moving on. Um, so the objective, mentioned this before, of of this whole uh, Federal Water Pollution Control Act was to restore and maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the nation's waters. Um, and the goals were to eliminate all discharge and in the, by 1985, and the interim goal to be achieved by 1983, wherever attainable, a level of water quality that provides for the protection and propagation of fish, shellfish, and wildlife and protects for recreation in and on the water. Um, and in addition to that, prohibit the discharge of toxic pollutants in toxic amounts. So essentially what happened here was, all right, this great objective, we want to restore and maintain the nation's waters. Obvious goal, I think everybody can agree. The only possible disagreement would be like, well, look, I've got this big industry, it unfortunately pollutes and I can't do anything about that all these people that I employ are gonna, you know, go, you know, have no job if, if this industry goes away. You know, that's, that's my concern, you know. Okay, well, can we at minimum prohibit any toxic pollutants in toxic amounts? So that's important because toxic pollutants, um, kind of like that pathogen thing, you know, maybe we're totally fine having a tiny bit of toxics. And that's true, if you look in, chemistry in our bodies or our toxic compounds that exist just in very small amounts. <clears throat> caffeine is toxic in high amounts, so we don't want to discharge caffeine, for example, in toxic amounts, but we consume it every day and discharge it every day. Okay, this interim goal turns out to be really the, the meat here, because the first goal, I mentioned this before, eliminate the discharge of pollutants, that's not practical. Um, and I kind of outlined why. So this interim goal kind of ended up becoming the primary goal in that we're going to protect receiving waters to the best of our ability. Okay, so there's a few things that were changed along the ways. One was a technology-based water uh, quality, um, technology-based and water quality-based requirements. So sometimes we, we don't have the facilities everywhere to track exactly how much mercury we're discharging, for example. Turns out to be an expensive test, especially because we know we want very, very little, so we, we need a very high detection limit. So in place of doing checking for the water quality itself in all cases, sometimes we say, all right, so long as you're treating it in this manner, you have enough treatment capacity so that we are confident if you're doing this treatment process properly, you're gonna remove 99.9% .9 of the mercury, something like that. Then you can use this technology-based and we prescribe technologies rather than water quality standards. So there's some nuance that was added, um, adding significant penalties when you, people violate their permits. I talked about this already, this permit compliance as a shield, shielding uh, the industries, facilities, individuals. You know, as individuals, we can't discharge wastewater either uh, unless we get a permit. Um, so shielding them from lawsuits and all of that. Okay, 1976, we introduced this uh, priority pollutants category with uh, 129 pollutants. This is different 65 categories of industries that have specific pollutants identified. We know what a paper mill is typically going to be producing in terms of um, contaminations or excuse me, there's 21 industries here. Um, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so I, I mentioned pretreatment. Some of this became uh, 1977. Some of that stuff was added to be kind of official. Uh, 
legislation. The NPDES system has pretreatment oversight. So um, the, the government then is regulating what an industry is discharging before that discharge gets to the municipal system um, so that we kind of have control on both sides of that. That way we don't have uh, industries and municipal wastewater treatment plants fighting each other. Um, there's kind of a, a layer of protection there. Stormwater for a long time was dis discharged, um, you know, collected in our sewers, or in our uh, stormwater collection sewers. And a lot of times that was mixed in with our normal sewers systems. And that's not a great idea when it rains a lot because then you get sewage potentially overflowing into your streets. Uh, raw sewage, that is. Um, and then also potentially into rivers and streams, all of that. So the, the NPDES framework here, uh, it's dealing with all point sources, uh, discharging also all point sources that discharge pollutants, um, and specifically into waters of the United States. That's our definition. We've excluded a couple things I talked about earlier, like a waste stabilization lagoon or a agriculture irrigation ditch. If that's true, then you must get this NPDES permit to have authorization. Um, discharging to groundwater is a separate uh, system. I don't know a lot about it other than it's kind of similar. Obviously, they have a few different priorities in terms of, okay, well, groundwater, you don't want it to contaminate it to the point where if some if it flows and is used as a drinking water source by somebody else that that's a problem um, but it's a, a different framework essentially a pretty similar similar outcomes but a different framework so I'm gonna not gonna talk about that directly okay talk about this permits are like a license license to drive license to discharge um, can be revoked for cause. So, and these typically have to be renewed every one to five years. Uh, in fact, the longest time is five years. So if you're like a, a very minor uh, discharge person, you just have a car shop and you're, you have to have a stormwater permit um, saying that you yes, you are collecting your grease. You have these grease traps or whatever on your driveways, then, um, then yeah, you get a you update your permit every five years and don't think a lot about it. It's a small fee. You are a large, you know, Detroit wastewater uh, treatment plant that's discharging billions of gallons a day. Um, you're going to have a massive permit with lots of regulations and lots of stipulations. You're going to update that every year, and it's going to cost about three hundred thousand dollars as a fee to the state. Now that that fee to the state is what actually what um, pays for the this uh, permitting, um, this regulatory oversight. So we, this is not something that our federal government pays for. It's actually, we collect fees from these permits and that pays for the um, regulatory oversight. Okay, so there's some definition about what's a point source. You could talk about, okay, is it, you know, how is it conveyed to the point of discharge? You can imagine you could try to get creative um, to avoid being a point source or whatever. Um, but there's lots of uh, fine print to define that. You can think of a point source as the point at which stuff is discharged. Um, one thing it does not include is sewage discharges from vessels, so ships. So if we got um, casino ships or cruise liners or um, tankers of any sort, um, those are not regulated. That's a, a marine, a marine issue, and um, just given the different sets of rules and the complexities there, we actually uh, allow. I think NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, I think NOAA handles it, if not um, a different part in Department of Commerce. But it's interesting because if you have a, a big ship like that come into one of your waters. You're regulating that water, trying to keep the the water um, protected, and then the ship is doesn't care. Then that that can be a big problem. Okay, so we talked about the different classifications of pollutants here from the Clean Water Act. 
talked about what is the waters of the US, um, all interstate waters, all waters that could affect interstate or foreign commerce, all impoundments, tributaries, territorial, wetlands adjacent to waters identified above. So if you have some sort of marsh wetland that's adjacent to a river, that would count. Um, some rule, rulings and laws and stuff. Um, does groundwater count? Um, I mentioned this, treatment ponds and lagoons do not count. Um, so we'll probably wrap up here. The second module here, and we're almost to it, shows a little more information about the lists of pollutants and things. Um, but what I'll leave off here with is the Cuyahoga River revisited in um, June 2009. So article in the New York Times, the first time Gene Roberts fell into the Cuyahoga River in 1963, he worried he might die. Mr. Roberts smelled so bad that his friends ran to stay upwind of him. Recently, he returned to the river carrying his fly fishing rod. In 20 minutes, he caught six smallmouth bass. It's a miracle, he said. The river has come back to life. The, today, the Cuyahoga is home to more than 60 species of fish, said Jim White, executive director of the Cuyahoga River Community Planning Organization, a nonprofit uh, that coordinates cleanup efforts. Beavers, blue herons, bald eagles nest along the river's banks. Smallmouth bass, by the way, are rather particular about their water quality. They like clean, cool, clear uh, water sources. And so it really is a, a pretty good testament to um, the difference that these uh, regulations have made and, and their enforcement. You can, you can go on and take a look uh, further if you'd like. There's some interesting data about how many rivers and lakes and stuff are impaired. A lot of, a lot of times it's just, you know, a swamp is low oxygen. So it's considered impaired in terms of oxygen, but that might be its natural state. Uh, there are, are lots that are still impaired based on human impacts, um, but lots of progress. So with that, um, I did also want to apologize. I didn't mean to put the exam on election day. Um, I set up the syllabus at the beginning of the semester based on, you know, which, what, you know, classes win, and didn't think much about it until it was close to time, and then I didn't want to change it all on you all, so I do apologize that was not intentional. Um, anyway, that's all I have for you. Take care. I'll see you next time. So why do swamps have low oxygen? Um, all this organic matter from the sediment and stuff, so Louisiana is a good example. It's all this all of our soil is almost, you know, at least in the southern uh, portion, it's almost all based from sediment that has poured in through the Mississippi Delta for over many years. And that sediment, it's rich with organic stuff. Um, it's pretty fine particulate. And when water is just kind of standing in, in a situation like that, it's not getting a lot of oxygen re-aerating it. It's hot in the south here. so. Temperature affects the dissolved oxygen capacity of water. So the hotter the temperature, the lower amount of oxygen can be dissolved. And with all that organic matter, it's just common for there to be a lot of bacterial activity. You've seen the LSU lakes fill up with, um, like if you look in it, the sediment apparently has been growing over the years and it's getting effectively getting shallower and shallower. That's bacteria growing and dying and accumulating that sediment. So there's a lot of, if there's a lot of nutrients, a lot of biological activity, not a lot of mixing or stirring, there's going to be low amounts of oxygen. It's not going to be none, but it's going to be pretty low. But also why you break the soil So why you break the soil or overturn it for um, like growing things? Yeah, so it's the same kind of concept. You want your, the soil, your roots, the roots of the um, plants to have access to oxygen, and if they, it gets too um, depleted, um, yeah, that would that'd basically be the same principle there, that you, the oxygen transport to the roots is important. So the bacteria also just picks up all the oxygen? Um, yeah, so the bacteria would, especially in like kind of a, a muddy type soil, it is common for bi biological activity to deplete, deplete it of oxygen. If you were to go to um, like marsh and dig up deep soil and it smells rotten or smells like uh, 
rotten eggs, it's hydrogen sulfide that you're smelling. Mm -hmm. um, that's an anoxic reaction byproduct. So oh, okay. you can cut, like, to an extent, it could go that extreme, or maybe just in your general soil, um, it's just not getting a lot of oxygen. Some of it's soil, some of it's the, the bacteria, maybe some of it's just that it's, um, I guess it, it probably would basically be bacterial um, or other organisms actions taking it out, but probably not completely depleted unless it's smelling that, you know, kind of rank, yeah. <laughs> rank Perfect. smell. Cool, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Whenever you, like, you talk about like putting all that junk down in like bowls and stuff and it causes problems, what about like things like the Durango and like your cleaning products, so what is like a pollutant kind of thing? Yeah, so if, if you're putting Drano or something down your, down your drain, um, it kind of depends a little bit on what it is, and they try to design stuff like Drano so that once it's um, diluted with other stuff, it's not too big a deal. So we're, we al always are flushing lots of water with um, chlorine in it because of our tap water has chlorine. So Drano often has a lot of bleach, which is concentrated chlorine. Um, and it'll probably have some other stuff that helps kind of clear uh, clogged materials or degrade it. So you don't want it sitting there in your pipes because it would probably harm your pipes eventually. Mm -hmm. And if an industry was discharging large volumes of that, um, like a, a large flow of that, it would probably be pretty bad for the wastewater treatment plant. Mm -hmm. Or if we all dumped a gallon of down our <laughs> pipes all at the same time, that'd probably be a big problem, right? Yeah. But if it's small enough and we flush it down pretty well, it's, it it's turns out it's, it's usually okay. There was a big problem with um, detergents used to use a lot of phosphorus mm -hmm. and so everybody using phosphorus based detergents made it so that wastewater treatment plants couldn't remove enough phosphorus from their systems and they ended up with uh, a situation where they would always have too much phosphorus so we had to actually change the the commercial side of like um, so products yeah so it might be chemical engineers that would design a new product that yeah. could do the same effect, have the detergent effect without adding the phosphorus. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good question.